Amen. I needed that this morning. Amen. Let me just pray for a minute. Father, too often in my life, I'm, t I'm busy. God, I'm not still enough. God, help us just to be still and hear your voice. God, if you don't speak, God, we got to hear from you. It's not about me. God, this is about a Savior. It's about a cross. It's about to shed blood, God. God, I want to be pleasing to you. I want my life to be pleasing to you. <laughs> God, we need you this morning. God, I pray that you help me to preach the word, God. Hide me behind that cross, Lord. God, give us exactly what we need, stand in need of this day. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10. It is so good to see each one of you in the house of the Lord this morning. This is why we come together, church. This is why we come together. It's, it, it's the presence of the Lord. It's just something about God's people gathering in one central location uh, to worship Him and to open His precious Word uh, there's nothing, my living room sofa cannot take the place of that. See, that's, that's where it's so important for us to come together. Uh, we're going to read a portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 10. Um, we'll begin reading. I tell you what, we're just going to start reading in verse 35, and so I can give you the whole picture of our Scripture this morning. So if you have your Bibles, found your place on your phone, uh, stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. In verse 35 of chapter 10 of Mark, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant us that we may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drank of, and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drank of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with shall be baptized be baptized but to sit on the right hand and on the left hand is not mine to give but it shall be given them for whom it is prepared and when the ten heard it they began to be much displeased with James and John but Jesus called them all to him and saith unto them you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority upon them but so shall it not be among you but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister and whosoever of you which be the chiefest shall be the servant of all and even so the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many Brother Cole, would you pray for us? I'm sorry, Brother. Amen. 
you can still get this with Rocket Ship. Um, what I tell you to reload your card, your cards for this. Put your own hand across the counter for this. Reload your cards properly. Amen. You may be seated. This morning I'm going to share with you a message about the, on the marks of the believer. The marks of the believer. Uh, you know, each one of us carry a distinguishing uh, mark on our life. And that is, that distinguishing mark means that uh, there's things that clearly recognize or discern us as different in our lives. And, uh, you know, the characteristics could be of, of something or someone. There's a distinguishing mark that sets us apart. For example, uh, in something, you take a car, there's, there's car after car after car on the road. But when you drive down the road, you see the ones that have the blue lights on the top and usually a big star on the side. You re instantly recognize that vehicle, well, that's a police car there. It's very different. There's marks on that vehicle, and sometimes there's, some of them are unmarked, and that's usually the ones that get you, ain't it? It's those unmarked police cars <laughs> that really slips up. My wife can testify to that. She's very familiar. She's, the tickets is, is unreal since we've been married. Some unmarked police cars that usually gets her. So we, we think about these marks of, of these cars that's very different. And, and we think about people. We talk, talk about, let's talk about people, the someone part. Uh, there's marks that distinguish us as different. And uh, for some of you, you may work a job. Uh, John works a job that he wears a uniform. And on that uniform, it says Orchid on it. Don't know what it says on there, John. So, and a lot of people probably, they don't, they don't really recognize him as John. He may meet one of his customers out there and they say, Oh, yeah, you're the Orchid guy that comes through my building. You're, they recognize him for the marks that his uniform and things of that nature. And we've often said that. Uh, to people because we recognize the, the way they are dressed. We're very different in this room. We can recognize the differences between us. Uh, some of us have a lot of hair. Some of us have a little hair. Some of us have long hair. You know, or some of us are fit. Some of us are, we need a gym and, and things like that. You, we recognize the differences in us and we're very, they're very distinct and they vary in color. And, and so is true for us spiritually. Uh, so is true for us as believers. Uh, you know, a believer uh, should have a distinguishing mark. So my question would be to you this morning, uh, just like, uh, you know, there's things that people say about us. Sometimes things are unjustly said. I get that. But overall, when people uh, hear our name or when they see us, they think something. They think about the mark that identifies you as what they're doing. There's something that identifies. I, I, when I think about Mike, I, I don't, I honestly, I think about UPS. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, you know, that's for how many years that's been a part of your life? 30, 30, 40? 34, 34 years. So it's natural when I think about Mike, I think about UPS because that... But there's other things. As, as a believer, I got into thinking about us as believers. What should identify us? When people see us, uh, you know, what should they, would they identify you? What would be this, what would they say uh, that you are and you fill in a blank there? You, what would they say about you? A lot of people that know Larry knows he's a carpenter. And a lot of people would say, Larry, he's a great carpenter. And we would fill that blank in with that, you know. A lot of people, uh, and, and, and for you you young people, uh, some people might know Fisher, and they might say Fisher is a good blank. What might they say, Fisher? Just thinking about that. How, what would, how would your friends identify you? Isaiah, how, if I did the same thing, each one of us can ask ourselves that question. You know, Isaiah, when, they th when people think about Isaiah, when they see Isaiah, what do they say? What is the first thought that comes to their mind? You know, that's their thought this morning, that we as believers have, have marks that identify us. And, uh, and those marks do matter. Our, our testimony, does, it matters. You know, I was thinking about, uh, and, and people recognize us in very distinct ways. 
And, uh, and it may depend on how long it's been since they've seen you. If it was prior to salvation, I've had friends come up to me and I've had this happen. They have not seen me since I got saved. And, and first thing they do, Brother John, is run up and they'll blurt something out that'll turn your face as red as Mike's shirt there. I, I'm serious. And it's like, man, no, no, don't, don't say that. No, don't. I don't. That's not me anymore. You know, and that's the first words out of our mouth. So we understand those situations, but we're in the house of God. This is Mission Baptist Church. In this community, when people think about Mission Baptist Church, what is their thoughts going to be? As we go forward to minister in this community, uh, I, I would hope that would, you know, you think about the thoughts. Well, I don't really know much about them. I see them go in and out the building, and that's pretty much all I know. You see what I'm saying? You know, it, it's significant uh, to how we impact people in our community. So today I was going to share with you a mark that um, uh, should be present in each one of us's lives. In the scripture I read to you, we had an issue here. Uh, James and John in verse 35, the sons of Zebedee come and come to Jesus. And they had a request. And you notice in verse 1, this sounds like something my boy would say to me. You know, have you ever had your kids come up and say, Hey, I'm going to ask you something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is, but will you say yes? Will you say yes to whatever my request is? It's like, a, it, I don't know what he's going to ask me. I mean, it could be, a, can I have a million dollars? You know, I don't know, Miss Judy. This is sort of what, this is sort of where these guys was at. Guys, these are, these are our disciples. These are our disciples in the Bible. These are real people. But in other, in other accounts of the gospel, they actually brought their mother with them. They actually had their mother with them in the other accounts of the gospel. They brought their mom. These are grown men, guys. These are not. They had a, they had a request. And what they was asking was that one of them wanted, in, in, in Jesus' glory, one of them wanted to sit on the right hand, and one of them wanted to sit on the left. Well, that was pretty selfish, wasn't it? They, they wanted, in other words, when Jesus, in his glory, in his, his kingdom, they wanted to rule with him. And they wanted to sit on the right and the left. And notice the response in verse 41 of the, the others. They was displeased. This that, how, that would be, how would you like, you know, and this happens all the time amongst kids and a lot of times among, in the church too, amongst adults, uh, that we feel like favoritism takes place. But these two guys was wanting to be favored. They was wanting to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus. And Jesus, to, plainly, he gave them, you know, he told them that that was already prepared, that that wasn't his to give. Uh, he went on in 40, verse 42, and told them how this uh, lordship takes place in the world amongst the Gentiles, that they exercise this lordship and authority over people, and they rule in, in sometimes like a tyrant, uh, a tyrant uh, type way uh, with people, very harsh, very rough on them. But he went on in verse 43 to say that this would not be true amongst God's people. That it would, in other words... Uh, the way they rule and reign out here in the world sh and the way they treat each other out here in the world should be very different in the house of God. It should be very different amongst God's people. And that's what Jesus was trying. He pulled those disciples together. He began to teach and he began to talk to them. And, and you know, we think about this in God's kingdom. Uh, we think about the, uh, all of us being a part of God's family. Uh, this could very easily happen in the church and it does happen in the church. But what he told them here in verse 43 was the first statement he made. He said, but whosoever will be great among you will be your minister. Minister. And he said in verse 44 again, And whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. A servant. And you think about this. A servant? I mean, what are you saying, Jesus? Greatness equals servant? That, is that, does that not sound strange? 
To be great in God's kingdom is equal to being a servant. Well, does that sound opposite of the world's uh, philosophy? That is not what we are taught, guys. We are not taught that being a servant is equal to greatness. The world teaches us very much opposite of that. And I'm not against the American dream. I'm so thankful I live in a free country. But I'm, I'm afraid what's happening a lot of times is that we're in, been indoctrinated with this. Uh, this is what life is. This is what life is about. It's about the American dream. It's about success. It's about self-fulfillment. All of that is about a bigger something for me, a, a larger something for me. And in many cases, that's the unguided philosophy of this world. That's what our young people are hearing in the schools, that you need to be successful. And, and there's more people. You've got to have a doctrine. You've got to have a Ph.D. You want to you wanna get a great education, and I'm not against it, but that's what they attribute success to is, and greatness to. And, and instead of servant, I, I need to be a servant. I need to minister to others. One of the greatest things that me as a believer personally could be known for, and one of the marks I hope people know me for, is that they would say I was a servant. One of the marks that I would so desire that Mission Baptist would be known for was when people in the community talk about us. As we begin to minister here, they would say, that church loves to reach out and serve others. That would be one of the greatest things that could be said of this church. And that would be the focus of our ministries, is reaching, reaching out uh, to others. We have each other, we fellowship, and we love each other. But there's something about reaching out to someone else and serving someone else. Uh, this question come up, uh, it come up at our house this morning about service. I go to the kitchen. And it's like I do many mornings, and I fry my two pieces of bacon and my piece of bologna and put my mayonnaise on my sandwich, and I sit down to eat because I'm going to study, okay? So I go over to the dishes as I do a lot of mornings, and I'm sitting there washing the dishes. So Courtney walks over to the stove right behind me and takes out a pan and puts it on the stove. I say, what are you doing? She says, I'm cooking your kids breakfast. In the tone of voice, I knew. And I looked at her, and I said, well, I'm washing your kids' dishes. <laughs> this is a, even in her house, we, even in her house, we, we see this sometimes. And me and her are picking at each other. We was, but this is very true. Sometimes we feel, even in her own house, well, you know, I'm doing, all the, I'm doing all the service, and this person ain't. Look what they're doing, you know. I mean, you know, you could help me out a little bit. You know, one of the things, guys, you remember our mission here at Mission Baptist is building faith and family with a focus. And it very much, I want to speak to your family for just a minute on this topic of ser service. So we want to teach our family and our kids uh, that, you know, it's not just, let me just say this, service extends from the church, but service extends into your home also. Okay, it's about serving each other. That, that's about being a servant, being a servant to my wife, being a servant to my kids. Now, there's position of respect. That doesn't tear down your position. Mike is still the head of his house. He's still the husband. But in, in, a, in a lot of ways, we as husbands, we serve our family. We are a servant to our family. We care for our family. I'm afraid we're raising up a generation of kids, guys, that does not know what service means. They do not know and understand what it means to be a, a servant, Brother Cole. And that is one of the things, me and Cole's talked about this before with these young men and the ones here and the kids here in the class, is that we've got to teach them to serve. And, and we've got to teach them to serve each other. One of the hardest things for Isaiah and Jonah to do is to serve each other. There's just something about the flesh that does not want to do it. And I'm going to share with you a few thoughts as to why uh, that happens. But I want to encourage you uh, within your family to set up and be intentional about service. We've got to teach our kids that we serve each other. 
you know, if there's four pairs of shoes there, and ain't but one of them yours, I, I've told them last week, I said, it's mighty nice sometimes if you just take all four of them and you just do it, you take it and put them up in the closet. Just out of generosity. You do something for your mother or your father, your sister or your brother. That's servanthood. Guys, this, we, we think it's the big things. I'm serving at a position in my church. And that is great. It's great to serve in the church. But it goes service and servanthood goes way beyond that. It goes into the house. And if it ain't made it into your house, we need, really need to check up on what, what this service really means. It, it, our heart and, and, and where are we really at in our relationship with God. But I want to encourage you to be intentional with your kids and, and to teach them how to be servants. And, and I've told Isaiah and Jonah this, you don't have to get paid for everything. Well, now, we start an allowance, you know, and they do work for money. But then if you say, Brother Larry, I need you to go do this, they say, Brother Mike, how much does that pay? Okay? Well, Zero. It's part of being in a family, you know, and, and that's true for the house of God, you know. But we want to teach our kids, guys, I, I cannot tell you how important it is. And, and the thing of it is, if my boys don't see me serving my wife and my wife serving me, then that's going to be the first thing that needs to be took care of, if you know what I mean. Uh, we really have to check our hearts and our motives to buy, as to why we're doing it. So, service. What can hinder us from being a servant? What can hinder you from being a servant? And it comes down to this. I'm going to share a, a message with you tonight about humility speaks. There's, two thing, there's one thing that gets in the way of us being a servant many times. And it can be summed up in this one word, pride. Pride. When I say the word servant, and you know, actually, now guys, uh, you know, I believe, I teach from the King James Bible, but in many translations of the Bible, and if you go back to the original uh, manuscripts, there's probably a word that actually fits even better than servant, and that's slave. In many instances in the Word of God, you probably would see the word slave instead of servant. You know, this is serious business, guys. But when we talk about it here, our, our Bible says servant and uses the word minister. But one of the greatest things that can hinder us is because it sounds like a lowly position. It sounds like somebody's degrading you. When I tell you to be a servant, it, and, and guys, you know what it is? It's the teaching of this world. We've been indoctrinated with this philosophy that says greatness measure, is measured by success and position in life. And that is not true in the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach these guys. That no, it's not like this in God's house. It's not like this in God's economy. We minister to each other. We serve each other. And Jesus, you can look in the Word of God time and time again, He did this by example. He set the example before those guys and before us. Pride. We talked about that. I'm going to share with you a few scriptures. I'm just going to read to you. Pride. God hates pride. And, and listen, guys, this gets the best of me many times. In, in so many subtle ways of, in my life where I allow pride to slip into me, slip into my life and instead of me doing it instead of me going ahead and taking care of it and and doing it for my wife and, and things like that well you know that's her job to do that you know things slip in and it's like yeah i'm in this position you know that's her position you know and and that's what we have to be careful of is and that's not the servant mentality slipping in so what is, what does god say about uh, pride. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and pride and arrogance. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 21, 4, and a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. 1 Timothy 3, 6, not as a novice, least being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. 1 John 2, 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. 
so we see that God is, God is a hater of pride. And that pride comes, where is the source of this pride coming from? The world. It's the indoctrination that we've experienced from living in this world. And that's where it comes from. And then on top of that, guess what? We have this flesh that we have to deal with. And it loves to be fed by success. It loves for you to feed that type of behavior to the flesh. It loves for you to carry out those types of deeds. And so when we think about that, pride God hates. He, he does not honor. Pride is dominating this culture. Uh, and you think about this, this culture and, and this self-centeredness in this culture, this self-promoting in this culture. It's me, it's self, everything you see on social media, if you look at it, it's generally about self. They're promoting self. And we see this a lot of times. We, what's going on across our nation, it's about me. And it's definitely full of pride. So what does God love? God loves humility. God honors humility. So James uh, 4, 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but God gives grace unto the humble. Micah 4, 8, And he has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doeth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Psalms 138 and 6, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Proverbs 13, or 15 and 33. The fear of the Lord is instruction of wisdom, and before honor, humility. God loves a humble, broken spirit. He, he is pleased with, a, with the believer that the mark of their life is humility. And that's what I want to share with you tonight, some of the things that humility says in the message tonight. But you may be wondering, what does, uh, what does God want me to do here? You know, uh, what can I, when it comes to answering this question, uh, the question, the answer would be, is he wants you to serve others. Right. Let me give you a truth here. When we, give God, when we give Jesus Christ his rightful place as Lord of our lives, his lordship will be expressed in the way we serve others. For the believer, when we give the Lord Jesus Christ the rightful place in our lives, Lord of our lives, not just Savior. I'm thankful, that the church, I'm thankful that he's my Savior. But he's more than a Savior. He's Lord of my life. When I give him his rightful position in my heart, then it's expressed through the way I love and serve, serve others. Does that make sense? It, see, it's evident in our lives. When, when, when God is Lord of our lives, we won't have no problem serving. We'll, we'll serve others. It's when, when, we, when we give that lordship over to self and say, well, I know what I'm, I know this, and it's me, that's when we get filled with pride. So lordship also equals humility. Mark 9, 34, And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be last of all, and the servant of all. Last of all. Last of all. I never liked being last. I never liked being last, Mike. I always wanted to be first. Do you remember from the time you was in grade school, what position in line did you want? First. When the teacher said line up, you wanted to be first. I mean, admit it. We all did. I didn't want to be last in line. I wanted to be first. You know? And you see where that, that thinking, we've, it's so indoctrinated. It's that it's, the good thing is to be first. It's not a good thing to be last. But in, the, in God's economy, what he's telling us here in Mark, it's, it's the last position. It's good to be last. You know? And, and that's not, that doesn't fit our, our thinking. So, I get it. You're telling me, preacher, I need to serve others. You're telling me I, I need to give 
uh, to others. I need to be a servant. I, I get that now. You telling me God loves humility and not pride. I understand that, preacher. I understand what you're saying. Uh, how does he want me to do it, though? Uh, what am I, how do I do it? What do I do? So 1 Peter 4.10 says, As every man has received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The truth is, God has already given you all that you need. You may not realize that. Because you, you may be the person that's in here that's always been last. And you may not feel like you have a gift. You know? You may have never been first in life. You may at all. See, we, when you're talking, everybody's been through so. Everybody, we think everybody's went through the same situation we went through. But it's not true in life. The truth is that there's people sitting under the sound of my voice that always came last. You know? You didn't realize you was in a good position already, did you? <laughs> You was right where God wanted you already. We was the ones that was messed up, fighting for first position all the time. You know? And, and we, we just, why? Because we desire the praise of men. We want the praise of men. So in God's economy, he says that in 1 Peter 4.10 here, he says you've already received a gift. You already have it. God has already given you that gift. Within the body of Christ, there's many different gifts. We all might not have the same gift. And that's what amazes me is how God, when he, God brings people together to form a body, a local church, that within that church, he's given many people varying gifts. And, within that, and all God wants you to do is just use the gift that he has given you. And use it for His glory. Amen. That's what He's asking of us. He's asking us to be that servant. Listen, guys, I, I'm so thankful. See, to, for all this to happen, there's people that use their talents that never have taught a lesson. And I'm being serious, guys. These doors was hung by a carpenter that if he hadn't come and hung these doors, me and John would not have got these doors hung. I, I'm, I'm just serious. And he used that, that talent for his glory. He, he never said, write me a check for nothing. You see what I'm saying? I called somebody yesterday. Uh, I, went, I brought that countertop for the nursery. And then I realized, oh, yeah, Betsy said it's got to be cut. Well, I don't have a 62 saw blade. You know, that's not something you carry in your back pocket. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't want to go to Lowe's and pay $30 for one to make one cut, Brother Larry. So I, guess what? I picked up the phone. I said, Mike, you down at the church? <laughs> I said, I got a countertop. I'm going to bring it down there. I need you to cut it. Sure, bring it on. See, God is just asking us to use the talents and the gifts and abilities that he's already given you for his glory and to serve others with that. You say, well, I don't really have any skills. You know, I've met some people. I, I wished I had their personality. I really do. I mean, they're just so sweet and so kind, and it's so easy to talk to them. It's like you just want to sit down and just keep talking to them. But everybody's not like that. I truly believe that's a gift from God. And then besides that are personal testimonies. The truth is you don't have my testimony. You don't know where I come from. You don't know the sins that I've committed. You don't know where I was raised. You don't know my parents. You, you wasn't involved in any of that. And God somehow uses all of that at different times and places somebody across from me for me to witness to and to talk to. And guess what? They need to hear everything I just said. See, it's, sometimes it's just about sharing and loving and giving of yourself and will, willing to open up your heart to serve somebody else. And that's what service is a lot of times. That's what being a servant is a lot of times in God's kingdom. Why do you say all this? Because Mission Baptist needs everybody to serve. Honestly, guys, we can't have a church without you. That's it. That's it. It's called the body of Christ. And, and, and so God here in the scripture, he's calling us the, the greatest is to serve. The first, uh, the greatest is last here in God's economy. So we see this. We can demonstrate this love in God in the way that we love our others. And I like this saying, uh, living is giving. 
I don't know where I wrote that down from. I didn't come up with it, Brother John. This is on some. I heard it, and I can't remember where I heard it from. Living is giving. And I'd have to say that's been absolutely true. The best times of my life is when I've been pouring out and not taking in. And I'll be honest, guys. There's nothing like serving. There's nothing like giving. In the name of the Lord, it's... it's uh, we think about this teaching servanthood in our, our mission statement. We want to raise up a generation that knows what it means to serve someone else, to give to someone. There's so much self in it, and, and it's got to start in our home, guys. The reason why we got this mess in a nation uh, that we got now is it, a bunch of self-centered behavior. And it's full of pride. And, and we need to raise some kids in the house of God that's true servants. Notice the example, last of all, in uh, verse 45. He said in verse 45, we have the perfect example. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many Jesus gave his life it, it's not something that we do and then we don't do it's a lifelong commitment to serve Jesus his entire life here on this earth was spent in service that's he was always pouring out he was always giving at times to the, he was just physically and, and guys listen he was physically just exhausted I mean, he could not go anymore. He couldn't preach and teach anymore, Brother John. I mean, when he got in that ship to go to the other side and he had to take a... He was tired. He was exhausted. And many times he had to go around the crowd and get to a place of quietness and prayer like John sung about so he could communicate with God because people was always pressing in on him and they was always wanting from him. They, and most of the time it's motivated. They wanted the miracles and stuff that Jesus was doing. Service can be tiring, guys. So I ask you this. When we think about our lives right now at this point we're living, where is service in your life now? What part of your life is service plays? What part of your life is being a servant? How is it impacting those around you? If I say, I asked myself this question this week. For those that's been placed around me, the people that I, crosses my path each day, that has met me, what is the mark? What's the mark that's on my life? Would they stop and say, well, man, he's a real servant. He loves to serve others. He loves to give. He loves to, pour. He loves to help people. He loves to listen to people. Would, would people. Is that the mark of your life this morning? Let me read this scripture. John 15, 13 Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And see, that's the way Jesus lived his life. We all say we want to be like Jesus, right? We've got to be a servant. We've got to serve one another. We've got to lay down our lives. And that may not be lit the literal sense that you have to physically give up your life uh, on a cross to die like Jesus but it literally means laying down your life to serve others. That's what it literally means, that scripture. That we, and that means, <laughs> this is where it gets tough. That means some of the things I want, some of the things that I have plans for, some of the things, some of the ambitions that I have, they've got to be laid aside. I've got to put them to the side because they're going to hinder my service unto the Lord and that's the greatest question for all of us today is where we're at is God pleased with my life it ain't a matter of is, is the pastor pleased with my life it's a, ma it's a matter is God pleased with your life does he see that servant's heart I ask you stand with me in closing the mark of a servant the mark of a servant 
want to open up the altars if you'd like to come and pray.